Hi, everyone. Good to see you, even virtually. Um, I hope you're having a good rainy, cloudy Wednesday morning, and thank you for joining us. Um, I know some of you might already be at school and um, joining along with colleagues, or some of you might still be at home, wherever you are. Um, I hope that we can just take this hour to dig in and organize everything that we need to um, to get started with Google Classroom this year on the right foot, whatever your setting is. So um, I'm aware of all kinds of re-entry plans all over the place. And so I have lots of situations in mind. Um, and so while we'll look at Google Classroom today by its basic features, um, I will also talk through a few scenarios. So I'm going to share my screen and we will dive in. And just to let you know, if you submitted questions beforehand, I do have those. And a few of you emailed questions after the fact, um, I also have those. And so I will, I will make sure that I answer all the questions that I can, but of course you can use the, um, the Q&A here in Zoom as well. All right, I'm going to start sharing and we will dive right in. Excuse me, let me just ask for one minute. Um, I wanna remind people two things. One, this is sponsored by the New Hampshire DOE, so thank you very much to them. Um, don't forget to go on to New Hampshire Learn Remotely, where you will see um, more webinars posted and our website as well, demonstratedsuccess.com under webinars. We're posting them weekly. They're coming up and, and the schedule is changing, so please don't forget. Also, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and I will uh, try to gently interrupt Jacqueline along the way, but don't forget to let her have her presentation first before we start asking the questions. We're finding a lot of questions are coming up and then it's being shown only, only moments later, as you all, all you teachers know that feeling. Um, and at the end, we will certainly hang on for all the questions that have not been answered by the, by the demo. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I'll stop every once in a while too to check the Q&A. And so um, a lot of your questions will probably be answered um, and just throw them out there when you have them. And I will take a look at the box, at the chat box. So I just put a link in the, um, in the chat box, not in the q and I put a link in the chat box to um, a, a sort of like an agenda, but mostly the uh, tips and tricks that I wanted to make sure that I hit on today. And that way you can sort of um, have a, something to keep notes on later or to remember some of the things that we talked about, but also be able to access some of the uh, resources that I've hyperlinked at the bottom. So that is there for you. And I put the link in the chat box. So if you're looking for it, it is there. Um, here we go. One second. Okay. So let's just dive right into Google Classroom. Um, we're just going to, I know a lot of you um, have at least been working with it now since the spring. Maybe some of you, this is brand new for you this fall because you were using something else or you weren't using um, one single platform throughout the, throughout the school. Um, and so I... Google Classroom is muted for a moment, sorry. Google Classroom, it's, it's just a vessel. Um, it is a platform, but it is what goes into Google Classroom that will make the difference for your hybrid or your virtual learning environments, or even if you're fully in person um, using, using Google Classroom. It matters what goes in it and the kinds of routines and expectations that you set up, just like with your physical classroom. So that's really important to remember. I know a lot of primary teachers are moving from mainly using Seesaw to using Google Classroom and integrating Seesaw as a tool, so I'll just touch on that. And and the other piece too is I know uh, there are so many platforms out there that people are moving to like Schoology and Canvas and Edmodo and there's so many good ones. The thing if you're frustrated because you've been moved from one to the other, just know that they all do wonderful things and there are all things that that each of them are missing and so it's what you put in and how you organize it that will make the difference for your students. So let's just start back at our home screen when we log in and you have all of your classes that show up 
for you on your main screen. And they show up like tiles and you can drag them around if you want to reorder them for the ones that you, that you use most often. And always remembering that staff will see more classrooms um, depending on your role in the school than students will. And so while we might look at this and say, oh, that's too overwhelming for students, students will likely only see one or two or maybe three depending on um, how you've decided to organize it as your school. And so this is just something to keep in mind um, for, for both staff and students. The other thing on this homepage, which showed up, I don't know if this showed up a month ago, or I just feel like it randomly came out of nowhere is this to review button. And I'm really excited about it because the to review button, when you click on it, it now allows you to pull up everything that you need to review things that have been turned in or everything that you've already completed. It looks like I have some work to do, but you can also filter it by class. And so you can really focus on one individual class. You can focus on, um, you know, whatever it is that you need to do. So I'm really excited about that feature because um, that was kind of a mess in the spring, I think, for a lot of people keeping track of things. And when students are trying to keep track of things and you're chasing things down, then no one's having any fun and teaching and learning is not happening. So that was just something I wanted to point out. I'm going to jump into one of my, um, just one of my fake model classrooms here. So once I'm in, I have my, I have my lay of the land here. I have my stream and I have a few questions to address about the stream, my header, and then the left side. So I'm just going to kind of go through this page first and talk about some best practices and some ideas I have to help you keep things organized this year. Um, one thing for sure is the stream who can post there, who can comment, and considering what goes there. So if you keep the stream open for everybody to post and everyone to comment, and every time you put something in classwork, it shows up here, it will be a mess. And everyone will be frustrated scrolling and looking for things and trying to figure out where things are that they need. And so I really want you to think of the stream as a temporary location. Everything that goes here has a short shelf life. So I'm recommending, you know, if you're, if you're using this, I guess in any setting, posting your schedule for the day. Here's the schedule for the day, just like you would do on the board, um, just like you would do on the whiteboard or easel or wherever you might do it. Start posting it in Google Classroom and just project it to teach students that routine of, hey, we look at the, we'll look at the stream for the schedule today, just like we look on the whiteboard. And so in that way, you're teaching that routine and you're starting to use Classroom for, for these, um, starting to use the stream in Classroom, sorry, for these uh, temporary pieces of information. I like to keep it so that only the teacher can post on the stream. This is not because I don't want students to have freedom to um, interact and communicate. We want that, we need that. Students need to have a place virtually, especially if they're 100% virtual. They need a place where they can banter and, and talk and be kids. Um, but the stream in your classroom isn't the best place for that because you really wanna keep this as an information zone. Um, for families at home or for kids to just log in, check out the stream to see what's happening today. So on the left too, you can see um, students can look at work that's upcoming. If they click on view all, it will take them to everything that they have assigned in that class. For you as the teacher, it takes you everything that you assigned. And so um, students have that option as well to, to, uh, to click on. All right, so how do we get that to happen in the stream? So let's take a look over here at the gear in the top right. These are your settings. And so when I click on the gear in the top right, I have a lot of pieces of information. I can put in my class details. These are the things that will show up on the class header. I have the general information. We'll look at some of these in a moment. But here is where we want to look at our um, keeping our stream clean. So right now I have students can only comment you may want to start the year with only teachers can post or comment and then gradually model what it looks like to, to share thinking online or to comment online. Kids will not naturally uh, transfer um, the give and take of conversation from physical space to virtual space. And so that is something that needs to be modeled and taught. You definitely want to let them have their have their moment, post a question, let them comment, let them get out all, you know, get out everything they want to get out, like the yo, hey, what's up, all of that. And then start to use that as a teaching point and, and teach kids how to use that commenting feature. So if you feel like you can dive into that right away, you could do um, students can only comment. 
if you want to just uh, gradually release that to students later, you could start with only teachers can post or comment. So here's the other one, classwork on the stream. So this is anytime you post anything in classwork, will it show up on the screen? You can choose that everything's hidden, that it's condensed, or the full details. So if you posted like a video and an assignment and all the directions, that all shows up. Um, or you can um, just show it's just the condensed, it's just listing what it was. I recommend hide. And some people, this makes them a little nervous because they think, well, wait a minute, how will kids know when I posted something? And so this is where we start to think about routines. If the routine is to log into classroom, look at the stream, see what's happening today, and then click on classroom or click on view your work, or sorry, click on classwork and then click on view your work. That's the routine that you teach. We don't want to teach the routine. Here, I'll click save here. Okay, that's the routine we want to teach. We don't want to have this be a place where students have to scroll and look for things. We want them to understand, okay, I log in, I see what's happening, I go to the classwork tab and off I go. Excuse so, me for one minute, Jacqueline. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh -huh. I had tried muting everybody, but it muted you as well at the beginning. I didn't mean to. Everyone, can I ask you to please mute yourselves? We're hearing some background noise, and um, as lovely as everyone's kids are, it's just easier to have you all muted. Thank you. Okay. All right, here we are. Okay, so that is the stream and that is how you keep the stream clean. Um, just something to think about. Think about these routines that you want to teach. Um, another thing that you can look at in the stream is the, the three little dots. Three little dots in Google always means move to top. Um, or so not move to top means more and so when you see three little dots in Google and it means more you can choose to move to the top so if you want to bump a post up to the top of the stream you can delete it all together um, you want to edit it you know something you need to do or maybe you want to copy the link to this post and maybe you needed that link to redirect a student to something um, you know if they were absent you can redirect them by just posting the link for them back to an old stream post so they don't have to scroll and look for it. So just something to think about as well. All right, so let's take a look at the header. Um, right now, you can see that I have a meet link in the header. And this is my favorite, um, most improved feature by far, is having a meet link to accessible to students in the classroom to be able to get on this meet link with you whenever it is that they need to meet with the whole class. And so before there were all kinds of problems with meet in the spring. And um, you know, a lot of those have to do, a lot of those have been improved as far as the security and how you start a meet and things like that. But this one feature I really like because if you set it up correctly in the admin console, and so you can check with your schools, check with your G Suite admins, if it's set up correctly, this link is not accessible I mean, it's accessible to students, but they can't start a meet by themselves. So I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to jump over to my student view. And when I jump over to my student view, here we are. So here's that same class. If I click on that link as a student, here's what I'm going to get. You can't create a meeting by yourself. And that is what we want. Um, that was a big problem in the spring and that is now adjusted. And again, it just needs to be, it needs to be set in the admin console that students cannot initiate a meeting. But we want students to be able to um, click that link when it's time. So if your routine is every morning at 830, um, the class gathers for a short morning meeting, there's no more, you know, creating the link, emailing it to someone, figuring out the password and who has what, they just have to log in, go right, and they just tap the link right in their header um, of Google Classroom. And it will open for them right there. And so where you can get that is, again, in the gear. So I just clicked on the gear in the top right. And here we have it right there, meet. So I have one generated. So I, if, if I didn't have one generated, it would say um, generate meet link, and you could click it and then decide is it visible to students or not. Um, and then you save. And I make it visible to students because if it's set up correctly, if they click on it, 
it doesn't matter um, until I have started that meeting. All right, I'm just gonna jump over and look at some questions um, and see if there are any questions before we dig in deeper to the classwork tab. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's dig into the classwork tab. And oh, you know what? I'm one sorry. More. Yes. I'm so sorry. There was one that just popped up right after we said that. Okay. Um, someone is asking, can you post a Zoom link there instead? Uh, on the header, no. Um, but you could post the Zoom link um, in the post for the day. So if you posted the schedule and you were posting, you know, we'll meet at nine, just put the Zoom link right in there. You can do it here for sure. Yeah, and the thing is with, with these posts, when you create a post, I mean, you can add anything here. You can add all the things to a stream post that you can add to an assignment, video, something from your drive, a file, I mean, a link to another website, any of those things you can do. And sometimes, you know, you can use the stream too. Remember I said for short-term things. So if you said, you know what, let's stop what we're doing. Let's all look at this, um, this website right now. It wasn't something you, you already organized in classwork. You could just pop it in the stream and then tell kids that, to access it there. So yes, you can put links there. All right. Um, so I started experimenting with using emojis um, in classroom and it sounds so simple and it sounds so, um, it sounds so small, but in reality, when you're thinking about how visual kids are, and especially younger kids, so if you're moving you know, from K1 to primarily using Seesaw to just integrating Seesaw as a tool, making it as visual as you can is really helpful for students so that they can start to, to, to make sense of what's happening that day with support. Um, the other thing that I am recommending, really for all learners, but it really helps with the young ones, this extension Moat, um, which now in the spring it wasn't, but now it is um, it is compliant with uh, student privacy, and which is really great. This extension allows you and students to record their voice, and it just makes it creates a little play file in here. Really great for relationships because they can hear your voice, you can hear theirs, um, and students who. Um, are unable to type yet or un, um, are unable to type for any reason or just don't want to because we're just asking a quick question, you can use Moat um, and it's a really, really awesome tool. I'm loving Moat right now. All right, so let's dig into the classwork tab. A lot of the questions that I have um, really have to do with the classwork tab. So we're gonna start with thinking about how classwork is organized and the various ways you can do this. So. I've seen teachers organizing this in many different ways. Organizing it where one teacher has their own class and they organize these topics by subject. I've seen um, teachers collaborate, so all teachers in one classroom um, and they separate it by subject um, because they're all co-teaching in the same classroom. I've also seen those teachers just create their own. So if you, you know, if you're teaching sixth grade math and someone else is teaching sixth grade reading, it would depend on how you wanted to organize it and how you wanted to teach students that routine of accessing class, whether they were in separate classes or together under a topic. Some people don't like to do a topic at all. Some people like to do um, a week of 913 to 917 for your topic. And so to create a topic, you click create, week of, I'll just do this one right now. And then everything under that topic that they are posting has to do with that week. Um, it really depends on what works best for you. And you, there's no one way that's really better than another. They, I mean, all sorts of configurations will work, but you do need to pick one and think through it and really talk through it with colleagues so that you can pick something to teach that routine to families and students so it's consistent and clear. And if you find that it's not working, again, think through reorganizing it, but um, again, you'll have to reteach that routine so people aren't confused. So when you create a new topic, it's in big print and you can drag these and, and move them around if you want to reorder them. If you wanted to put an assignment in a different place um, or a resource material, you can move that. Um, those are all, these things are all movable in here. And it's also really important to teach students how to filter by the topics on the left so that they can easily filter down to the week or 
to the certain subject. And that also helps with classwork clutter so that if they are in a classroom and they know they only wanna look at the reading assignments for today, they can click on that so that they're not scrolling and looking for things. Um, it's, a, it's a really helpful tip, seemingly simple, but that keeps kids from scrolling to try to figure out what they're doing. Uh, someone did ask about archiving. I get this question a lot. I mean, the answer is no, you can't archive, but yes, you can. <laughs> so I always think there's a workaround for everything. So I like to create a topic called archive and I drag things down into it. And the way I would use this is if I had something that we've already used, we're already done with it, but maybe I'm not sure if everyone completed that yet. Maybe I have a few straggling students that still need that access to the slides or the, the assignments or whatever it might be. I will just sort of drag those to the archive. Um, so let's say the small group schedule is old, but somebody still might need it, I'll drag it there. Or I can just delete it. I don't need this small group schedule anymore. I'm just going to click delete and it's gone. And so the classwork tab does get long and crazy. And so the question you know, still remains, okay, if I drag a bunch of things to archive, my classwork tab is still long. And that's where teaching the routine of not scrolling here, but clicking on the left here can be really helpful to students. If they're going into the classwork tab saying, okay, I'm doing reading today, and now I can clearly see the things that I need to do. So just kind of a little tip for organizing that tab. The other tip I have is um, creating a new classroom every month or every trimester or quarter, whatever it is that you have going on in your school. Um, it, at first you think, oh, I have to create a whole new classroom, but it's really not a big deal. You know, you can go back, you create a new one, just click on people and add everybody and add your students in. And when they log in to their class, they won't know any different because when they get here, they'll see their brand new class and they'll see just a join button. So it doesn't even, um, students don't even have to do anything else to, um, to access their new class. So just kind of something to think about. Um, so then the other tip I have for organizing the classwork tab is not posting everything as individual posts. So what I mean by this is, lost my screen for a moment. So not posting everything as individual posts. So if I post every single video, schedule, assignment, image, photo, like everything that I'm doing, this the classwork tab is just going to get really long. And so what you really need to keep in mind is that when you create something, like say it's a resource material or it's something like that, So you could in one, um, in one material or one assignment, you could click add and you can add multiple things in here. So just remember you can add, I don't even know what the limit is in an, an assignment or in a material resource, but you can add multiple things in here. So if you had a full collection of the, um, the graphic organizers for whatever unit you're doing, they could all go there or something like that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with that is using slides. I mean, using slides is probably the best way to organize all of your teaching for students in a way that sort of maintains that flow for kids. Um, and I know a lot of the, the details, or the, sorry, the examples I'm showing right now are, um, are primary, um, but all of these things apply to, to various ages. So for example, if I'm ordering, if I'm organizing my teaching and learning for the week for reading in slides, instead of these slides all being individual classroom posts, um, they're in the slides and the students move through the slides. And so you can make them interactive in different ways. Um, you could add a slide deck as an assignment where students get their own copy and maybe throughout there's a, there are text boxes here and there to respond in. Um, maybe you use the add on Pear Deck um, to make them interactive. I'll show Pear Deck in um, just a quick moment here. There we go. So I won't have time to go deep into Pear Deck, but it's essentially, it's an add on that opens up in the right side. 
as soon as it loads here, and it allows you to add all sorts of interactive features to your slides, multiple choice, um, embedding a website right there, draw, just lots of responding things, and it's really easy to add audio to a slide. It's literally a click record, and it puts the audio link right there. So really great for access for kids um, to be able to use that audio link. Um, what else are we looking at? Okay, so when I take a look, when I think about these slides, I might also think of the fact that maybe students just need to view these. They don't need to edit at all. And maybe I want to link to various places. So you can link to a classroom assignment. You can link to a seesaw um, activity. And so, for example, here, if we're working through all of these pieces that lead up to me wanting to know how the student is doing with this skill, asking, asking questions, um, to for comprehension, then I would create an activity in Seesaw with the same text and I would get the student copy link from that from that activity. There's three dots in Seesaw too. You click on it, you say grab student link and you can hyperlink the text right here. And then it will take students right to Seesaw to share their thinking and you just want to have a direction in Seesaw that says okay head back to classroom or head back to your slides now so they know where to go after they move out of the slides or out of classroom into Seesaw. And you can do the same thing for, um, for an assignment here. So let's say I've created an assignment. Whoops. Jacqueline, can I pause you for one minute and just yes, ask please. a few quick questions? Mm -hmm. One is, just can you review again, um, when you add a new class, do you have to invite the students again or can you copy from your previous list? Um, you, you add them again, but let me think about the easiest way to answer this. So you add them again. If they are set up in groups, if your um, G Suite admin set up students in groups, you might be able to just start typing in grade one, yeah. So like for example, I made a group of students, of the grade four students, or if, if your G Suite admin did that, that's all you have to do. So you could find out about that. You could click and you can add, I mean, if you just start typing in their names, they'll pop up and you can quickly click them on. Or if you have um, like a spreadsheet of their, of their logins, you can just paste them all in here. You can just copy and paste the whole list and it will go there. Does that help with that? It does. Um, I have another question, but I'm also yeah. going to ask everyone, if you can please write your questions on the Q&A, what I try and do is I try and write Jacqueline's responses back just so everyone has them and also I can put them in a paper for you to look back on when you get the, the folder from us tomorrow and your professional development certificate and everything. So if you can put your questions in Q&A, that would, that would uh, make it easier for me to create that for you all. Um, the other question is, are there any Google Classroom webinars or resources specifically for related service providers? Um, not that I know of, but we can definitely go into that. I have a few questions here about specialists in classroom special education, and so I'll definitely be able to touch on some of those. And if you have more questions that follow up after that, certainly let us know and I can help you with that. Super. Thank you, everyone, for participating with questions. Again, if you can just put some in Q&A. Oh, there's one more over there. And thanks, Jacqueline. Let me give you this one, too. Hold on, please. Okay. Um, oh, she wrote it in the... In the um, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. I'll respond on that. Thank you. We're all set. Good to go. Thanks. Okay, great. All right. So we were just looking at linking an assignment. And so again, three dots in Google always means more. So if I click on these three dots, I can copy the link and that link is directly to this assignment. It's not to the classwork tab or the topic, it's directly to this assignment. So that if I have that link and you get to the part in the slides where you want students now to go to that assignment, something, you know, something that they're going to turn in, giving you some information about their learning, when they click on this, it opens the full assignment. And so they don't have to go looking for it. It takes them right there. And I really love that trick because it keeps kids from getting confused and scrolling in the classwork tab and trying to figure out what they're supposed to do when and really keeps kids from feeling like I have to click in this activity and then I have to click on this activity and then I have to click on this act activity. Um, the slides really help you keep that flow. So just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, so another question I have that I wanted to address here was how do I assign to multiple kids or to multiple classes? So I'll just uh, show that right now. 
And, and on, in that same vein, um, we had a question just pop up too. Is there a way to have a classroom where children don't see each other or know who is in the classroom? Um, no, but I have, I think that might be a special education question. And I have a, um, I have an idea for that, something that I've been helping with. So I will add that on. Okay. Um, so here's my assignment. And if, let's say I, oops. Where, do, where did we go? There it is. Okay, let's say I need to assign this to only four students. So let's say I click on this and I only have one in my sample classroom, but I can just individually check the boxes of students that I want to receive this assignment, this material, this resource, this whatever it is that I'm posting. So I can do that. I can also do that in the stream. So that is something to keep in mind. If you're a co-teacher specialist in, uh, in the, um, the general ed classroom and you're working with individual students, you can post things just to those individual students or assign things for those individual students and nobody else will see it. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The Did other you click on the assignment to access the link? Say that again? I'm sorry, Jennifer wrote, wouldn't you have to click on the assignment to access the link? Wouldn't you have to click on, do you mean like click on this to get the link for it? Uh, Jennifer, can you elaborate on that? And I'm sorry, Jacqueline, I'll let her elaborate and I'll, I'll come back to you again in a few minutes. Okay, um, we'll take a look at that. So when I'm in here, let me go back to my edit. So I can also, um, think in terms of posting to individual students, but I can also post to multiple classes. And so for this one, let me double check here. Let me go back into a different class for a moment just to, to model this one. I'll do this one. So if I'm posting something in the classwork tab, here we go. I'm just going to create a fake one here. So see over here on the right where I have all students, when I'm first initiating the assignment, I can send it to multiple classrooms. So if I know I have this same group of resources, materials, assignment, whatever it is, um, even if it's not a tech assignment, I'm just giving the same directions to multiple classes. I can check on those and then it will post to all of those, um, to all of those classrooms. You'll have to go organize it where you want for the topic. Uh, for those other classes, but it's something that you can that you can do. The other thing is that you can schedule them. Now you can only schedule for one class at a time, which is why the reuse post um, feature is really helpful. So if I wanted to schedule this, once I had this built, I could click on schedule and decide what day and time it was going to show up for those students that I'm posting it for. And then for, um, let's go back into this one. And excuse me on that too. Um... Is there a way to separate one classroom by different grade levels? For example, a classroom of fourth to sixth grade that needs to have morning meeting together, but different core content. Uh, you could do that in two ways. Uh, let me just finish that other one first. I'll finish just answering that other question. Is that, Sorry, exactly. uh, that's okay. Um, the other thing that I was mentioning was this reuse post. So if you can't, you can schedule to to one class, but if you want to use that post, it's not going to load, load for me right now. Um, you can use that reuse post feature. Those were those arrows going in a circle. There we go. We also have this here in the create tab in classwork to reuse. And what that will do will pull up all of your classes and then you can go and grab the post that you wanted to schedule and for various classes. So it does take a, a couple extra seconds to do that, but at least you don't have to rebuild the entire post. So just to jump over to that question about organizing by grade level, I mean, you certainly could have one classroom in various grade levels in here. I do think that would get really, really messy. So what I would do is say they all had morning meeting together. I would probably post on the stream. Um, so let's say here, um, grades four through six, see you at 9 a.m. for morning meeting. And I might, uh, put my link in here so I can do add link. I can add my meet link in or I could add the zoom link and any password information I needed and then over here I can check the boxes. So if, if it's something for morning meeting, you could just check all of the boxes or if this is a consistent schedule, I would even <coughs> Excuse me. 
go into the classwork tab and under resources, I would make one called, um, let's just make it a material because it's not really an assignment, um, weekly meetings and schedules. And then here you could link any, um, any weekly schedules or just, you know, sort of those longer term things that kids need to access. And you could put the link to, um, you could have just a standing link for that morning meeting and then teach kids the routine that when it's time for morning meeting, whether you post it on the stream or they just, they just know at this point, they can click on the classwork tab, go in here, click on their link and join their meeting. All right, any questions before I jump to the next one? Yes, hold on one minute, please. Let me, I'm trying to, I'm not, I'm not as good at any of this as you are, so trying to type and read. You're doing um, <laughs> what if you want to maintain privacy and want to assign a single assignment to multiple kids, do you then have to assign over and over for each child? Okay, so I think I understand. So let's say I wanted to assign to four kids. Are those, are, are you asking then, are those four kids going to know they all got that assignment? I think that's what, what you're asking. I, I'm, a, I'm thinking also. I, yeah. So I take it there, that's all the, the question is. Yeah, they, they, they won't see that. And so one school I was working with the other day, we created a topic. So let's say, I'm just using my name. We created a topic called Mrs. K. You know, Mrs. K is um, the special education case manager or paraprofessional or whoever that comes into the room and helps. And so I can create this and I could even just create a video. I'm just gonna drag it to the bottom here. Let's do it one more up so you can see, there we go. And then I could even create a, a video that just says, you know, hi everyone, like, you know, you know how I come in your classroom, I'll come in your virtual classroom too. And so just sort of how, you know, we think of services being somewhat trying to be seamless, right? Many adults are moving in and out of the physical space in the virtual, um, in the physical world. And we want to do that in the virtual world too. So to normalize that we have many adults that help us. And so you can have this topic. All the students will see this topic once there's a post but they won't see anything posted under there unless it's posted to them. And they won't see who else does that unless you post something where students are supposed to have a conversation um, or where you are asking a question, you're using the question type and you make it so that students can reply to each other and edit answer. And so you may just want to avoid that if you don't want them to see each other um, in that small group. I would, though, think about the, you know, what the intent of the activity or the resource or material you're, you're posting is, because if you think of the physical space, if, if I say these four kids, I'm going to work with them in the classroom, and then I'm going to pull them out and we're going to go do some intensive work um, in, my, in my classroom, uh, they see each other at the table. So if you're doing something with that group, um, they would see each other in physical space. And so if you're doing that something similar in virtual space, it's the same thing if they're seeing each other. But if it is something that you wanted to keep separate, yes, you can definitely do that just by posting to, to the uh, students that you want, making sure that it's not any interactive work where they're having a conversation or something like that. I hope that answers that question. And I think that before we go on to any other questions, I'll just address um, adding other teachers and specialists and co-teachers into classroom is that adding a co-teacher into the classroom, you do that via the people tab and add them here. They can do everything except delete the class. And so um, that way you can have any adults that need to be able to pop in just like they would in your physical classroom. Any adults that need to sort of see what's happening or see, you know, support students. But those people would want to make sure that they have email notifications turned off for all of these classes they're in or your email inbox will be really, really crazy. And so again, thinking in terms of what will your role be in the virtual classroom, if you're also in the physical classroom, just trying to mirror that in the virtual space um, and really working together, collaborating as co-teachers in this space as to how things are organized, how things are accessed so that you're all on the same page. 
uh, uh, for, for special education, one thing to think of, you know, sometimes teachers will say, well, can I make a whole class for all my special education students? And the answer is really no, um, because you, you wouldn't typically work with your entire caseload at once. Um, but what you could do is be a co-teacher in any of the classes where you have students that you work with. And the same thing goes for guidance counselors, specialists, um, you know, any other support um, professionals that are working with you all, add them in as co-teachers so that they can post to individual students as needed. All right, I'm going to pause there because I think there are some questions, right, Elizabeth? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, Amy had just elaborated and said she was more concerned about the families not seeing the other kids in the classroom. The families not seeing and in the general classroom at all? I guess. Yeah. I mean, something's got to give. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so, I mean, there are probably some more nuances to this question. And so if you want to email me um, separately, it's, it, this could be, it could be a concern you have. It could be something you've heard about. Could, there could be a nuance here. So please yeah. email me and we can talk about it. Okay. But I always go from physical to virtual space. And I think you see the class list for everyone in your class. Things are hanging on the bulletin board. We interact in, in a school community. Um, so, you know, we're not as a, as a school community going to hide from each other um, in this space and, unless for various individuals, there's a specific reason. So um, definitely email me and we can talk through that if you need yeah. help with that. I'll, I'll uh, make sure she specifically has your email oh. after as well. I, I, everyone will get that, but thank you, yes. Um, Oh, it's, she's clarifying, but I'll have her talk to you about it after. She's uh, okay. as a PT in the school. She needs to maintain privacy. Thank you for clarifying. absolutely. I'll ch chat with you. Um, uh, another question: Can you make a video on Google Classroom, and if so, and and if yes, how? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go into all things video and pictures right now. I have a, I always get a big list of questions. So remember that Google Classroom is a vessel. So it in itself doesn't have, it doesn't have anything in it, right? You create it, it's just there. And so everything that you're putting in comes from somewhere else. So there are a number of ways to make a video. By far the fastest way is the extension Screencastify. Screencastify is my best friend. I use it all day, every day. I use it nonstop to make screencasts. And the free version, you get up to five minutes. And for the most part, you, you typically won't need more than five minutes. It takes some practice to get videos down to five minutes. If you teach older students, you might need a 10 or a 15 minute video lesson, but probably no longer. And so you could do the paid version or you could just record yourself on Google Meet or record yourself on Zoom and use that video. That's another thing that you can do. And I like that with Screencastify, it's right here accessible to me in the top. I can do my whole desktop. I can just do the tab that I'm on if I want to give um, students a tour of a website they're using. I can just do my webcam. And so if I just do my webcam, I'm just creating a video of myself. There we go. And you can select everything here. And the other reason why I love this tool is because it stores everything right in your Google Drive. It creates a folder called Screencastify. You create the screencast and it opens there. So we'll just do a quick one here. It asks, what do you want to share? I usually do my whole screen because I click around a lot. Hello everyone, just making a screencast, thank you. Okay. I stopped it. It just was a little bit delayed because I'm running many programs right now in screen sharing. And so now what this will do is it puts my screencast in here. I can quickly trim um, the beginning and ending off if I want. I don't have to get too fancy. I can rename it here, math lesson, with the date. And then it creates a link in your drive. You can also, if you're using your YouTube channel um, just to store your videos instead of Drive, you can do that too. Just make, you can make it unlisted um, and then you pull that link from your YouTube. But uh, I won't send kids to YouTube. You could embed or link that somewhere. And then the other thing I love about Screencastify is this right here, export audio only. If you export the audio, it takes the audio of the screencast you made and it makes it its own file. 
And so you can insert that audio into a Google slide or you can insert it really anywhere. And so if you want to read something or have something, um, you know, any of the reasons we can think that we would want to include audio. And it's the same kind of file in Screencastify. It just shows like little headphones um, versus like the, the movie, the, the, the movie icon. So screen Hello everyone, just making a screencast. Yeah. There we go. So and you can play it and you can look in there and, and sort of see um, if that's if that's what you want to do for your video. And you don't have to get too fancy with the videos. You know, you don't start and restart your teaching in, in person over and over. If you make a mistake screencasting, you just keep moving. Or even better, if you get kind of flustered, you just pause. Um, you can pause right from the extension up here and pull yourself together, get whatever you need, and then you can keep going from there. So Screencastify is definitely my top favorite tool. Thank you. So the other thing that, let's get rid of this. Um, the other thing that comes up a lot with video is um, issues viewing the video or um, being prompted to download. I had that yesterday that people were prompted to download a video when it should have just played in classroom. And so that was a little odd. But um, the way I would, I would recommend adding videos, well, I'll show you a few ways. One is you can add it in an assignment or as a resource. You can add it in any of those kinds of posts. And so it was a Screencastify video, so I could post that right from Drive. It's going to pull up all of my files from Drive. And look, it says recent right here. Here was that math lesson, so to speak. I just click on insert and it puts it right there. And I can add in you know, all of the other things that I might need to add in. Or if you are storing your videos on YouTube, so instead of grabbing them from Drive, you chose the YouTube um, option on the far right, then you would uh, paste in, you would do add YouTube and you would paste in your link. And your link is unlisted on your YouTube channel. It's not that people are gonna go, they can go looking for it and go finding it. You're just doing that to get the link yourself. So that is the best way for teachers to do video. Um, the other thing to think of is inserting your video right in your slides um, and how you do that, I'm going to go to a blank one here, is if you're in slides, you can just choose insert video. Here's where you would do audio, by the way, if you pulled that audio file off of the Screencastify that you did. Insert video and again, are you pulling it from your drive? And you can select it and put it right in. Um, if you were pulling it from the URL, you, you know the YouTube URL, you can paste it right there. And so that is how, that's how that works. And then you embed it right in. And you can resize it and all of the wonderful things that you can do in slides. So something else to, to think about, um, especially for younger learners, they don't have to go in and out of things. You know, I went into this assignment, now I have to go here for that video and there for that. Those directions sort of keeps it moving a little more smoothly. For students to create video, if you're using um, if you're using Seesaw, keep using Seesaw. It is great for those kinds of tools. Students can also use Screencastify, um, the free version. You know, if, if, this, if the uh, G Suite admin pushes this um, extension to all of the users in your G Suite domain, then kids will have it and you can teach them how to make the screencasts, how to um, insert it from their drive. And they would do the same thing. So if they were turning in, whoops, if they were turning in work, I'm going to go over to my student view. Here we go. Uh, so if I was accessing this assignment and for my assignment, I am going to add or create something. This is where I would click here. And if I, I already made my video, I would pull it from Google Drive. If I wanted as a student to create something to submit for this assignment, I could do that here as well. I could paste the link to my video if I was using YouTube. Um, so students do that same thing. And notice here that this says mark is done versus turn in because this assignment didn't have, excuse me, didn't have anything linked to it. I didn't link any, um, you know, I didn't, it's like photocopy. I didn't photocopy anything and pass it out for all students to do their own thing. I wanted them to generate their own work. So they have to add and create, or, you know, maybe I just created a, um, a place for them to write in their answer if I used a question and then they would just have to click mark is done. So students can also use Screencastify really, really easy and free. 
So I highly recommend it. And there are a ton more tools. There really are. Uh, we video is a great tool, but it costs, um, you know, they can make, depending on their device, they can just, if they have an iPad, they can just make the video on their iPad and upload the file from there. Um, and if you're using Padlet, totally separate tool, but if you're using Padlet, um, let me just open that one really quick for you. That is another great way for students to turn in and create video and audio for themselves. So let me just open a recent one. We'll just do this. Padlet is one of my favorite, favorite tools. It does have, um, it does uh, do sign on with a Google account. So that is something that makes it really easy. And so I can in Padlet, I can click right here. I can take a picture right from my device. I can upload something. I can add a link, but right here, all of these things I can do. Capture my voice, make a video, record my screen, draw. I mean, you can do all the things in Padlet. So it just depends on what tool you want to use. And remember that tools always support the goals. And so we don't want to get too wrapped up in the tools because they are all really fun, but choose the right tool for your goals. Uh, the other question I had was about tracking assignments. For, for staff, the best way to do it was how I showed on the main screen um, where you could access that to review. You can also access it here on the left. For students, they will, let me jump over here again. Students will, so right here in the classwork tab or right here, this view all, it takes them to the same place. So view all shows me, it will show me everything in that class that I possibly have. Again, in the classwork tab, view your work, that's the same thing, another routine to teach kids. And down the left, what was assigned, what was already returned, what's missing. And if students have multiple classwork, classrooms, they can do the same thing you can. They get their to-do list for all of their classes and it lists their class along with it. You can see things are color-coded with the class view all. You can even see at the bottom we have um, what's happening this week, next week, later, just kind of organizes it. So another really great thing that if you are setting up your virtual classroom, a routine that you teach students, you make a screencast video to teach students how to access all of these things, to teach them what goes in the stream and where to look for things in the classwork tab. And you're doing this for families and caregivers too. Um, I like to even create um, a diagram. I did this. I either did it in Google Drawings or do Google Docs. I did this one in Google Docs. I could have just done it in Google Drawings. It might have been easier. And just make, you know, adding in text and arrows and all sorts of things just to show here's where everything is. And so people can always take a look back and access that and the resources in your classroom so that um, so that they, they get used to what the routines are for everything. The other question I had that was submitted before, um, somebody asked something about pre-K and play, and I wasn't quite sure I understood the whole question. So if you're here, if you could post that in the q and I'd love to address that if I have time. Um, and then the last one I have here is about sharing your screen. Um, so it depends on what tool you're using, I guess. Uh, you can share your screen in Google Meet in the bottom right. There's um, an icon for sharing your screen. There is, if you're using Zoom, there's an icon in the bottom to share your screen. And so um, if you're sharing your screen with students, that's all you need to do. And one good reason to share your screen, oh wait, I'm in the student view, let me move back. And one great reason, is if you haven't played with Jamboard yet, this is, this is your new tool you wanna to play with because Jamboard is everything in an interactive whiteboard that you ever wanted. And here's just a pretend play one, open it up. And it creates slides or pages. So you think in, in the, the physical classroom, you might write something on the board and erase it and then do another sample math problem or you're writing on the chart paper and then you turn the chart paper page, that kind of thing. You can do this here. And when Meet finally gets its updates, this is integrated. So from a Meet, you can just click and start a Jamboard right away. And um, you can share your screen with students and you can do the modeling, the sorting, the model problem, whatever it could be. Um, and then you can open up the link 
pop the link in the chat box for students and then they can also write and interact on these. Um, and this is really great for small group work too. So we don't have time to go all the way into Jamboard, but definitely something to um, definitely something to explore. And you know what, I will for this, this sheet about all of these tips, I will add a link to some Jamboard examples so you can start to think about what that might look like. Um, what kind of questions do we have, Elizabeth? I have one more thing on my list, but I just want to make sure I address what's out there first. Um, they, the, the, I don't know if, if the one from the very beginning was, was answered enough. Jennifer, if you want to let me know, the one that started at all, um, a woman was asking when she is adding a slide to a single assignment, do you have to click on the assignment to access the link? I think I'm putting that together correctly. Um, now, okay, so I'll just walk this is going back to the beginning of, of your yeah, so let's say let's say this is the assignment. Let's say this narrative draft is the assignment. These three dots on the left, I need to copy that because that link in the slide with that link with that assignment linked is where they're going to to click. So say they're moving through the slides and you have click here. When you hyperlink that, so either by clicking on this link in the top, I like to do Command K or Control K, um, depending on your computer, and you paste the link in, excuse me, then when students are moving through the slides, they have to click on this and it will take them right to that assignment. So I think, I think that might answer your question. Um, please let me know if it doesn't, um, because it, it's leading them here. You're grabbing this link and it's the same thing in Seesaw. There's three dots, it says get student link. Um, and so you copy the link and you paste it in the slide so they can just head directly there. And is, is that how you share a worksheet? Um, that's, that's not the same, correct? If someone no. wrote, how do you share a worksheet? But I, and I... I mean, if you were gonna do a worksheet, you would add, either add on to another um, assignment or a collection of materials you had, you would add that on there. Um, but it really depends on what format it's in. Um, you know, worksheets in virtual spaces are not our friends. Um, they create a lot of work on both sides for teachers and students, that's just a little cumbersome. And so there are lots of ways to address that differently. Um, I feel like I could do a whole day on alternatives to worksheets and virtual spaces, but um, whoever you are, if you email me and sort of talk me through the kind of the kind of worksheet you want to assign, um, I can help you think of the best way, the best way to do that. Oh, that's great. Um, someone wrote showing worksheet in live streaming. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you had that sheet open on your screen and you were sharing your screen over a live meet or a live Zoom, or even if you were recording it, then yeah, you would just pull it up on your screen and, and share the screen for them to see. Um, but if you want students to interact with that in some way, then that becomes a little bit, that becomes different. And so that's why I think that we'll be able to talk more in depth about that. Um, just shoot me an email. The, the last thing I have on here was someone was asking about ways to, to split their screen. There are a lot of extensions out there that will split your screen. I just heard of one recently that will tell you that, you know, to do this tab at 70% of my screen and this tab at 30% of my screen. Um, I want to check that out. I can't remember the name of it, but I use tab scissors and glue. I've had tab scissors and glue for so long. And essentially what it does is it takes the tab you're currently in and it just splits your, whoops, oh, because I'm full screen. Hold on, let's get out of full screen here. There we go. Let me come back here. It's hard to show this one in full screen. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. Oh, I don't have tab scissors and glue in this one. Never mind. We're running out of time. So <laughs> I'll just tell you that a bit, essentially what it does is it cuts them in half. Um, where did that window go? I have no idea. I'm completely lost. It cuts it in half and it just splits it. So you can see any tabs that were on one side of it on one side of your screen and any tabs from the left over them those show up on the left side of your screen. So that was tab scissors and glue. But if you go into the Chrome web store and just search split screen, you're going to find a lot and you'll find one that works um, just for, for what you want to do. Um, Elizabeth, did anyone who asked the play question follow up on that? 
sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, no, I don't see the play follow-up question on this yet. Um, that's fine. I do have another question though. It says, this woman says, in the spring I created documents for questions and answers. I shared with students and they answered. Their docs were answers accumulated in my Google Drive. Is there a way to avoid that? Uh, so yes and no. Um, and so I know we're at time, but I am gonna show this. So if you want to think, if you wanna collect um, information from students digitally, um, you know, there are a number of ways to do it. One of them, if you're asking questions, you, your, your, easiest, your easiest route would probably be to create a Google form right from, you could do it right from your classwork tab, or you could create a Google form from your drive, and the form would have all of the questions. And then you would get all of the student answers in a spreadsheet, and you can also view them from right in Google Forms. Um, so that's one way, but if you wanted them to do it on a doc itself, you don't want to create and drive and share. What you want to do is create it here in Classroom. And I'm just going to create a brand new one, I think. Oh, I'm in my student view. That's why. All right, let's get this back to full screen here. Okay, so if I'm creating um, an assignment, you would put, you would link the doc on that was your template. So it's like you have this, you're going to the copy machine, right? And you're going to copy one for all of the students. Um, because you don't want to start things from Drive and have and share with students and have them share with you. That is a mess and you will fall apart very quickly. And maybe you already have um, from doing this. this. I'm just going to grab, I'm just going to grab this doc here. Okay, so let's say I put this doc in, it has the boxes and the questions and whatever I want students to answer. I want students get their own copy, make a copy for each student. I'm just gonna say test. I like to do things right now, zero and one or ungraded, just um, because assessment in virtual and physical spaces is really tricky right now. All right, so if I assign it then, every student is getting their own copy. Oh, it's not letting me do it because I don't own it. Regardless, for time's sake, here we go. Okay, so every student gets their own copy. So that as a teacher then, when I'm back, I think I finally, I was gonna say, I think I finally made Google Classroom mad enough that I froze it. There we go. So then as the teacher, when I access that assignment, I'm accessing it here and everybody's work is right in here. So as students open up that document and begin working on it, do you see how it says student one and it shows that document? You'll see all your students, you'll just see a grid, all of the student work and you can click on it and see their work as they're working. And so, you know, really the problem that Classroom solves is that the, the creating things in your drive and sharing and getting them in a folder and getting the right access and editing rights and that whole mess, you completely bypass all of that by using the, the various features here by thinking, okay, does everyone just need to view it? Does everyone need their own copy? Or is everyone editing one copy? Which typically wouldn't happen for a whole class, but if you were assigning something to a small group, you might just assign to four kids the same graphic organizer or something that they're filling out together. Um, because something about using Classroom is that for, as a teacher, your routine still might be that you're creating all of your things in Drive and then you're linking them into your assignments and your materials from here. But students don't need to do that. Students, and for some students who are used to always going to Drive, they're going to need to be sort of retrained to access all of their work through Classroom. And so the other question was, they all show up in my drive, is there a way to avoid this? Um, no, but they're organized for you. So if you click on class drive folder, students have this and so do you. So once you have, a, once you have Google Classroom, you have a classroom and then it has a folder for every class that you have. And then you can go into the individual classes and every time you create an assignment, those are all in their own folders. And then the student work is all in those folders. So it's all really organized for you. But where people get frustrated in Drive is when they see like the recent up top and they'll see student work as recent and that drives them crazy. Um, it's, it's just the way it's set up for now. Just You just have to ignore it.
are not just randomly landing in your drive. It is in a folder and it is organized. Um, it just doesn't feel that way because they'll show you recent things up here. So I hope that I hope that helped and answered that question. Um, that's great. A comment on it. But first, let me just tell everyone that tomorrow you will get um, an email from us auto populated from zoom. It will have a link to Jacqueline's slides. It will have your professional development certificate for you to print off um, as well. There's going to be a survey that pops up on that. We'd love for you to fill out. It should pop up after this as well. So you have two chances to answer that for us and, and review the webinar and tell us what else you'd like to see. Um, but just to go back now, in case anyone wanted to get off, just to go back for one quick second, finishing that Google Forms answer, a woman mentioned that Google Forms, their answers come up with their IDs instead of names. Are they able to change that in Google Forms from ID showing to names so that teachers can, can identify better their students? You just have to make the first question, what is your name? That's really the best way around that. Just every time you make a form, no matter what, just first question is, what is your name? Great. And then can parents add themselves to Google Classroom? No, uh, but they can get Guardian updates. So the short answer, just because of time, is that, let's see, let's go back here on the um, settings. So in the settings, the gear in the top, they can get what's called a Guardian summary. And um, I used to not be a fan of this. I've come around. Um, and so if you go into the gear in your top right, you can click and see an example. And it tells you all of the things that might be included. And then it has a link to an actual example. Um, it doesn't overload families with the information. It just shows them announcements on the stream and any assignments that are due or missing. Um, and that's another good reason to keep the stream clean so that they don't get a post, they don't get an email for every single thing that's on the stream. And I know we didn't get a chance to go into note email notifications, but if you're in multiple classes, you're gonna wanna click on the upper left and go to settings and work through the kinds of notifications that you get um, because that's something that will drive you crazy for sure. Okay, Jacqueline, as always, you are wonderful. To all of our attendees, you were super. Thank you so much. Um, again, this webinar will be available on our YouTube page in another day or two. Um, again, tomorrow you will get an email from us with um, all of Jacqueline's um, PowerPoint that she showed you and your professional development certificate. And it will have, um, Jacqueline, is your email on that? It is. It's, it's at the very bottom of, um, of that agenda sheet, that tip sheet. And, and please do email me. I, um, if you're frustrated or stuck or just confused or lost, please email me. I'd, I'd rather help you than know that there's a teacher out there really frustrated. <laughs> Yes. And, and don't hesitate to write to us at info at demonstrated success too. We can get um, in touch with Jacqueline. We might be able to answer for you as well. And as always, we're looking for your feedback. We're here to help you. So let us know what else you're looking for. And um, I'm sure if you're looking for it, there are others as well. And maybe we can create another webinar to um, make that easier for you. And also any information you can give us. We're really struggling as a company to support you, whereas everyone used to be on the same school schedule Monday through Friday at set times. Now people's school days are a little bit fluky times. So we're not sure if we should be hosting webinars at 2 p.m. or 3.15 or 8 a.m. or 7 a.m., that sort of thing. So the more information you can give us to help you, the better we are here to serve you. But Jacqueline, as always, fantastic, um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of you. We appreciate it. Don't hesitate.